Welcome to On the Table, a podcast about board games, card games, and tabletop war games. Well, welcome back to episode 89 of the On the Table Gaming podcast. And today I'm joined by Michael Kerr from Northern Front Gaming. And actually, I'm really excited to have you on the podcast, Michael, because you know, I feel like I've interacted with you and seen you in part of the community for so long. And now I finally get to talk to you, you know, voice to voice, I guess. So thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. People probably know you through some of the battle reports you're doing. And if you're down in Australia, you know, you're kind of a bigger fixture in, in that scene. And a lot of people also saw you on the CMON Expo Asia panel where you were one of the hosts. What kind of work are you doing and, and, and how'd you get into a Song of Ice and Fire the Miniatures game? Um, oh, I'll start with how I got into the game. I've played a lot of games. I've got a son who's now 20 who keeps dragging me along to play games and then he generally <laughs> drops them and leaves me behind to play. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm really into the into the A Song of Ice and Fire books and the TV show. And when the game was released and I first saw the Kickstarter, I ummed and ahmed because I just didn't really like feel like playing Stark or Lannister at the time. So I probably let the Kickstarter pass me by. And then a few people in our local community started playing. I live in uh, Townsville, which is a city a long way from anywhere else. It's like four hours drive to another city. Oh, geez. <laughs> so <laughs> in North Queensland. So um, you're like north of the wall or you're like Dorn or something. Yeah. You're, you're... Well, that's where the northern part comes from, northern front. <laughs> gotcha. Makes sense. They're very north, northern Australia. Um, and the community started growing and there was the three folk had just been released. And um, the main game I played previously was uh, Horus Heresy 30K. Mm -hmm. And one of the local guys um, also played the same Legion in that as me. And he just bought the free fake. I said, oh, I don't want to go the same. So I went Night's Watch and started playing. And funny story, oh. he never actually played free folk in an event. So <laughs> <laughs> I could have I could have gone free folk. And I finally, oh, you're finally moved north of the wall. Oh, well, okay. uh, but I've moved north of the wall now. I've got three folk, so um, okay, mostly playing uh, three folk and Baratheon. Oh, nice. I guess when the game first came out, I always wanted to do a, you know, Renly Tyrell side army yeah. all, all, all down to Sunspear and do the Dornish, but that's going to be a while before we see that, I think. I know, but knock on wood, I you know there's, they're, they've got the uh, Greyjoys coming out, and there's like, I mean, there's plenty of house factions to explore, but you feel like, right? Doesn't it feel like, you know, Dorne would be coming up maybe? Like, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we hope so. I sort of asked that question knowing I wouldn't get an answer, but you know. Right. <laughs> but I feel like I got to go back and look at the conspiracy theories. It's been a while, but like on the original box art, there was like a bunch of symbols. What was it? Was it the sun and the spear? What's their symbol again? I got to double check, but uh, it was sort of hinted at like, hey, look on the box art, there's a bunch of houses like, does this mean these are what we're getting? And I'm hoping yeah. that's the case. You know, I can only imagine what they'll do with Dorn. There's been so many cool developments they've made. Even just the Greyjoy look amazing. The sculpts are getting even better. Oh, and uh, yeah. even the recently revealed units, like, things are crazy. I could talk forever about the mammoths, but I'll, I'll try and behave here. And then for other things, like getting into doing battle reports and stuff, I just wanted to watch things and saw things and um, did a couple of battle reports just with, you know, the camera I had lying around and it had limitations. You could only record a video for 30 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, things, yeah. things you dealt with. Um, and I also involved with running a lot of events locally and with uh, Andrew Old mm -hmm. in Canberra. The two of us ran the Nationals at CanCon, which is a big gaming convention in Canberra yearly. Um, 2,000 people play various games there each year. So um, fairly large event, been going for 30 years, I believe. And yeah, so we're doing that again this year, providing we can open up our own internal borders. Yeah. And I can get there. When, it, when so. would that be this year? Late January, 25th Late January. of January, I believe. Last weekend in January. So we'll keep our fingers crossed, because that would be great. And I know that's a gr you guys run a great event there. Yep. We invited Benjamin Lynn from Blitz Minis. Mm -hmm. Andrew invited him to come out to Australia. So he actually came out and played at CanCon. Um, and our original plan was I'd TO one day and Andrew would do the other, but we will short one the first day when I was TOing, so I had to play as well, <laughs> which was a challenge. And so, actually man played, and ben on the final, played Ben on the oh, final yeah. table, and that I was a pretty that. fun experience. So... 
And he was and streaming he, uh, from there. Knocked me off, but we played some double games. Um, <laughs> in, encouraged, you know, it was good to meet him and grow the community. And he's hoping to come back again. Oh, absolutely. I hope, I hope so. And it's cool that, you know, you guys are able to connect and sort of bridge those communities, right? Uh, he's coming from more of the Singapore community. Yeah, well, you know, they're in the same time zone, roughly, it's as true. us, but still, still <laughs> well, a long we were, way We away. were all reminded of that when we saw that Simon Asia panel, the Expo panel, and I think it was like three or four in the morning for me, and you all yeah. looked very, you looked very well rested and, and chipper, and I was like, oh, gosh, okay, here we go. It's like five o'clock here, it was 5 p.m., it was a good time. <laughs> I had to banish everyone else from that part of the house. <laughs> oh, really? Were they? They were. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's a so cool, a few cool things that came out of the Simon Expo uh, that were revealed. I was sort of surprised when we showed up that they announced that they had those foil cards. Yes. Is that something you were going to pick up, or that you've picked up? I have picked up them, a few of them. Um, and apparently, yeah, they uh, look very nice and updated cards too. So yeah. Which I think bodes well for the future of the game, right? Is if, if they're going to be releasing updated cards, I know that's something that was kind of in, in high demand by people. Yeah, I don't know if they're still available. I think I looked last and most of them are still for sale. So people haven't grabbed them yet. So they probably should if they want updated cards and nice shiny ones. Yeah. And I was trying to figure out, I was looking at some of the listings and trying to go through and like count the cards. And some of them yeah. didn't match up. I don't want to like, this is like, not confirmed, but it seems like there are maybe more cards in a few cases than there are units. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but I thought for House Targaryen, one, two, three, four, five. There are five combat units, and the deck says it comes with 11 combat unit cards. Yes. So I'm like, well, what does that mean? Does that mean it's two of everything, and then there's one extra thing? There's an extra one in the Baratheons as well. From oh. the end of the out of those. Well, now I'm now I'm really excited to, to get mine and see what what's going on there. <laughs> so um, the, you know, the theory is the Baratheon one's the uh, champion of the stags. Yeah. What Ready would the target be though? Three dragons. You think so? Maybe. Oh my god, yeah. that would be insane some, if they did that. Some pikemans. <laughs> Some pikemen, some lions. There you go. We've yeah. got five straight away. Oh, my God. Oh, that's like going to fuel speculation for me just for, for days. I don't know how long it's going to take for, for things to get shipped out, but... Well, hopefully not too long. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, who knows? Here in the States, the, the mail system's all crazy, so it could be, could be <sighs> longer, but we'll, we'll see. We won't go down that road right now. Oh, we've, we've all got those problems. <laughs> yeah. And then the sculpts that were revealed, were there any that stood out to you? I mean, I, it was cool. We got a lot of the unit cards prior, like the Harakar or the Harakars and the Pikemen. And to finally get to see the, the sculpts in like clear detail was pretty cool for Targaryens. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, the Pikemen look really, really nice. Probably a nicer looking sculpt than the Swordmasters, I think. Yeah, that's what I really want to see. Um, and I love the way they spread them out here so you can kind of really clearly see the details. But for this particular <laughs> unit, I feel like it'd be helpful to see it uh, in the actual tray wh yes. where they're like all shoulder to shoulder just because they've got their shields and like it's you know kind of more like a phalanx formation sort of potential. Oh, you know, spears are always interesting to uh, fit on a tray too. Yeah, we're gonna be stabbing your hands and <laughs> the halberdiers that have, have broken. Is, yeah, yeah they've, they've, they've drawn blood the table. many times <laughs> in our games. It's like under the fingernails or things like that. You're like, how did I stab myself? Yeah. <laughs> and so we had the Hurakars, we had the the House Targaryen Unsullied Pikemen. We finally got to see the Baratheon Champion of the Stag models. Those look great as well, um, and. We also saw some new Baratheon units that we, we weren't really expecting here in the form of the Baratheon's Kingsmen, which have these like giant double-handed swords. And I try to take some notes here at the time. Fabio was saying uh, that they have, a way, uh, they have a way to work around tactics cards. And I didn't know yeah. if he meant that it, the unit revolves around, like the unit itself is based off having certain tactics cards, or if, if he meant there was a way to like, bypass from them all yeah maybe they've got a uh a order when they activate you can't play tactics cards or something 
Yeah, because you're saying it's a new way of Baratheons to work around their tactics deck. Or, or it's a, when they activate, draw a card. That, you know, Preston Greenfield built yeah, in as an order. That would be, be pretty nice. Something. That could be really helps, powerful. Help help Stannis without having uh, access to Elden Estimate. So, yeah. And the card draw. That mu that's got to be it, right? Because that makes the most sense. Uh, trying to like yes. cryptic read into Fabio's uh, messaging there. <laughs> that might be give a lot away. But I, that's I, okay. Yeah, he, he's. He, well, although I feel like sometimes he maybe like slips up and like lets a little bit more through than Michael. I don't know. Yeah, I was looking at uh, Michael's face to see when he went like, "Shut up, Fabio!" In his yeah. eyes. <laughs> it's all just a game. That's what it is. It's like just trying to read their poker faces. Yeah, <laughs> try to push him at that stage. My Keep favorite going. thing is just like the puns. I feel like Fabio slipped in a few puns throughout the event, and uh, yeah. just also getting to see Michael be like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it was a no. It was pretty good, good experience. Um, unfortunately, I was in the you know they were testing everything, and I missed a bit of the reveals at the time they were happening. Oh. But we had seen the we had seen the slides previously. Oh, so you were but like no, you're not no, thinking. no discussion on them. Gotcha. And you know there were some other slides they didn't actually show, so I don't know if they <gasps> so cut he wasn't them or they joking? ran out of time. Uh, he was yeah, saying, there was like, more oh, they didn't show. Stuff. Wow, really? Oh my gosh. Yes. I thought those were um, just idle threats. Ren Renly wasn't completely ignored. Uh oh, but He oh, was on man. the day, but there was some stuff. We so. got to start applying some pressure here and be like, come on. So Renly wasn't completely ignored. Because it did seem like Stannis got a lot, right? Because he got the. the uh, well, Stannis got the two units. Yeah, and the the roller lightbringers, which are crazy, right? Oh, movement five, they, three plus range, eight seven four, and you can see on the card actually they move the there's like a little L in a circle, so that yes. might be like a hint at like a graphical update we see where the range of weapons is actually put on the actual attack profile. Yes, they've got five plus armor, six plus morale, but it's really their fire arrows that have oh. vicious. And if the defender fails their panic test, they suffer plus one wound, and one other enemy within short range suffers a panic test. That's the, really good. They are crazy. I played some a couple of games where I proxied them in mm -hmm. and put Red Priest. Yeah. Um, Red Priest there. So, oh, I'm going to shoot at you behind this other unit, and uh, you can take a minus two panic test, and you're vulnerable in your panic, so they're guaranteed failing a save, so they have to take that panic test. And it in, was just pretty dirty. <laughs> there was your, on our make -a Monday on our Facebook group, you had a, we didn't start the fire. So first off, yes. plus one for, for the great title. So it was a 40 <laughs> point list you made with Stannis Baratheon, the rightful heir. And for combat yes. units, you brought roller Lightbringers uh, times two, both of the red priestess. You had the house yes. Bolton bastard girls with Stannis Baratheon, the rightful heir, because you're an evil, evil person. And then you had it's a nice combo. the two naked Baratheon Warden units as your anchors. And then you had for non-combat units, Melisandre, and then Salisa and Cyrene, Queen and Princess. I mean, for how fast you responded with posting that, I don't know if that was one you just had in your back pocket, but like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, that's actually kind of scary. That, that is the list I played, and it was very effective. By the oh. time Stannis is charging in, things are half dead anyway, so... Yeah, and then he's the just, girls just clean them up, wiping the floor with them. So now, as a Baratheon player, I mean, uh, you know, you hinted at maybe wanting to play more Renly here, but does this, you know, is this kind of, you know, is this going to make you feel joyful, being like, oh man, I can have all this good stuff in the Baratheon army? I think it's really good how the two sides have got different feels. So Stannis is obviously more aggressive, right? Um, you know, Rose Knights are a very strong unit as well, right? Um, they're going particularly well on the table. But they're, they're, they're not killing things quite as fast. So I played a game on TTS with... Um, I didn't have the, uh, the Lightbringers for the tournament, but it was uh, two Bastard Girls, one with Stannis, one with the Red Priestess, Cutthroats and a couple of Wardens. And it was a pretty funny game. I lost, but he only had like three, you know, a couple of guys left in one unit of conscripts at the end of the game. <laughs> Everything died, you know. Fets, yeah, doesn't matter. Blood they can die. Nightwatch Fets, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. 
So, yeah, I, I was most excited to see the the free folk attachment box, but that's just me. I know there's so many other good stuff. People listening will be like, what? But the sculpts that are coming out are so good. There's so much detail to it. It's, it's really nice. It's crazy. The raid leader in that uh, box they showed, like she's got dual axes and like you can actually see like scars on her face. It's just phenomenal. You almost want to play raid leaders just so you can put the model on the table. <laughs> exactly right yeah just you just gotta you gotta go for it and i'm just excited because these newer sculpts look so detailed and um you know even just putting these into maybe even mixing them in with some regular units if you don't want to even use them as attachments i'm just excited to see like the direction the game is going and that you know I, it was always solid the game the mechanics are always good the sculpts were always good but just to see how much better they're getting is just mind-boggling like all the gray joy stuff is incredibly crisp and just looks amazing yeah they've got a whole new faction with a whole new way of playing and it looks really interesting with the gray joys the pillage mechanic yeah and the different units getting benefits out of it a different way you know some are attacking more some are defending more as a result of their pillage tokens and yeah so they they spoiled the iron makers and then we have the iron bowman uh ironborn yes. bowman and so the Iron Makers, uh, for those of you guys maybe didn't catch a stream, they've got movement speed of five, and they've got great hammers. So they hit on a three plus at seven, five, and four. Their armor is a four plus, but remember this, we'll come back to it. The morale is six plus. They've got great hammers that have critical blow. So, you know, you roll, uh, and if the defender rolls a one on a defense dice, after the attack is completed, they become weakened. So that's very similar to the Baratheon style. But then their pillage token mechanic actually gives them armor. So for each pillage token, so when they destroy a rank in your opponent, they gain plus one to their defense dice roll. So they can get two more tokens on them, which will move them to a two plus armor, which is pretty Crazy. phenomenal. Yeah. Now the, the trade-off is they got to kill stuff, right, to do that. But the flip side there is that the bowmen can give other units pillage tokens. Yeah, so working together, those bowmen. So I feel like, is this going to be maybe more of a, a, a shooting, a, like a ranged army? Like, where it's a little bit more about, like, softening them from a distance and then hitting them hard? Well, even just, you know, you can march your uh, iron makers up, bowmen shoot over the top. That's true. If they they destroy your rank, you, uh, or even if they're already engaged with you, they destroy your rank, a pillage token, and... And they'll get that plus one out of that. It's yeah, just another way to add benefits to it. I mean, so the Ironborn Bowmen, if you guys aren't remembering the stats, they are ranged and melee. In range, they hit long range on six six four on a four plus. Melee, it's four plus five four three five plus armor eight plus morale. They're not sticking around if they get hit. They're gonna run off. But they can <laughs> reroll attack dice when attacking enemies in the flank or rear when they're firing their ranged weapon which is great. So if you position these really smartly, you can do a lot of damage getting those rerolls. And then they've got divide the spoils for melee or ranged after completing an attack for each enemy rank that was destroyed. One friendly unit with pillage in long range of that enemy gains one pillage token. So does maybe the strategy seem like it's going to be, you actually want to like, um, well, I guess it doesn't really matter when you get a token. I'm wondering like, is there any strategy in like doing almost a rank of damage and then hitting them with the archers to move that token to where you want it to be? Well, I suppose if you're charging with your iron makers and they fail to get killed, you know, do a rank. Yeah. The archers can come and kill that last model or two and give them the pillage token for when they're attacked back. Or if it's like they've Maybe. already got two tokens on them and you're like, oh, I don't want to get another token. Like, I guess I activate the archers now and then I'll put that token where I want it to go. Yes. It's also the Greyjoys have one of the commanders had an ability to, oh, Balon Greyjoy, NCU, replace the tactics zone, bring a previously destroyed unit on anywhere on the table yeah what <laughs> once per game uh he claims it's only it's a replace effect and he's a five point yeah. ncu this is like a big deal but it's not like he's like killing himself or anything like you still get no, him as the not. ncu piece and so a previously destroyed unit what comes back fully within long range of the friendly deployment edge long range of a deployment edge that's like or or anywhere. Or, you know, fully within short range of a flank or table edge, and they deploy activated. But you can just get, I mean, that and the, what was the guy called? The, was it the captain? I forget what the attachment's name was now. It was called the Reaver Captain, allowing you to have outflank. Like, you're going to be able to drop units and pull things in, like, all over the place. 
Yeah. And this is going to be a really, really interesting faction to play against. Uh, and we also saw Victorian Greyjoy, who is the Lord Captain of the Iron Fleet. He's a commander with assault orders, rush of aggression, sustained assault. And his order is overrun. When this unit surges forth, instead of surge forth, this unit performs one charge action. And he's got furious charge. Enemies successfully charged by this unit become vulnerable. So he's going to be all about getting in there and, and just smashing. Like that's your take axe to face kind of character. And and one of the interesting things really there is that the normal overrun wording has pivot and then perform a charge action. Right. Are they, is that just for that? Or are they going to change overrun to you don't get to pivot first? Because that can be pretty brutal with something with overruns. Oh, wait a second. Let me, let me just jump in the FAQ here. Was there any change? No. Let's. Um, I don't see that. He's, he's got overrun. Targaryens. Is there a general rulebook? Okay, we'll pause this part. I'll cut this out. Let me just jump in. General rulebook updates. No. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's different. That's just for that. So, I don't know if that's a. Yeah. If it's just, uh, just for that one model, or are they changing it? Or... Yeah, I wonder. So, that didn't come out in the 1.6 update. No, so, it's... maybe that'll be a future thing. Yeah. Um, and there was also Roderick Harlow, the reader. Uh, scholar among raiders and so he starts the game with two order tokens and at the start of any turn you may remove one order token from roderick if you do place any number of tactics cards from your hand to the side then draw one plus that many cards shuffle the cards you set aside into your tactics deck which is a great way to kind of cycle through and get the cards you need oh very much so uh, and that, so this seems like they've got and the great joys already seem to have a really obviously cool style of play and synergies. Balon looks amazing as a five-point NCU. Roderick the Reader, all the characters are great. We even have Theon Greyjoy, uh, and that's where uh, Fabio said they slipped in a, a pun <laughs> out of his three tactics cards. There are Diversion Tactics, Opportunist, and then Stark Exposure. Uh, <laughs> so I'm assuming that's going to do something that like, weakens you or sets you up for damage or something. <laughs> but the order is uh, his order is reckless heroism. When this unit performs a charge action before resolving this action, this unit suffers D3 wounds, but it counts as rolling a six for any charge distance dice. And he's got swift strike. Yeah. After this attack is completed, this unit may perform a retreat action. So throw him in with some archers. You know, if you get caught, you can hit and then disengage and shoot. Although I guess really anybody, yeah. it's going to be good. Yeah, it just seems like they're very. Uh... Got some good mobility tricks in the in the army. Do you think so, you'll yeah. be playing Greyjoy? Boats up. Oh, I don't know if I'll be getting into uh, that straight away, but I'm probably going to be tempted by the time they come out. I mean, not you won't be getting them when there's all these mammoths you could be buying, right? With the free folk, you know? oh, mammoths <laughs> and dragons. And I, there's plenty so of much. And you know, <laughs> we kind of just stumble through some of the Simon Expo reveals, but you know, here we are coming on. Maybe what is this? Has it been three years since the Kickstarter was launched? No. Yep. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Close so to. Close to. So, you know, where do you think the game stands? Do you see this is like a, being in a positive place? Um, I think it's, it's dealing with, with issues, you know, with COVID and, and distribution issues they've had. But the game development's growing really they're bringing enough things along. Um, I think the fact that for the new factions, there's going to be a hero's box and one or two unit boxes on release is a really big thing. You know, as someone who tried to play Baratheons with just a starter box. Right. I think that's going to that, be um, great for the game. I that agree. That made it really hard. But now you've got some options to play it and not everyone's playing with the same or wanting to buy two starter boxes just so they can get that extra unit. Or Right. <laughs> Yeah, and I think one Stuff thing is like, like that. I think that's really positive. I can't believe how fast the game has grown. Uh, you know, especially playing some other games. You know, we are up to how many factions now? Seven factions. So we're up to seven yep. factions, and there's so much opportunity, so many different things to play because the price point of this game is a little bit lower in some regards compared to some other traditional war games. Um, you could pick up multiple factions, and it's not uncommon to hear people playing like two houses, two factions um yeah i just you know i can't believe it like considering the fact that there is a global pandemic and things have been so difficult i feel like the community is still going strong 
There's a lot of interest in the game. And, you know, we're just getting to dragons now. Like, yeah. all this time before has been filling in things. Like, now when you're playing games when people walk by, I mean, they, it was oftentimes a game that would catch people's attention. But now being like, oh, yeah, like, here are dragons. I think it's going to be a, a, a big appeal that will draw more people in. Um, seeing some of these more fantastical sculpts that really stand out like that. I, I think we're in a we're entering into kind of like the golden age of uh, of uh, a song of ice and fire, pending people being able to get back into stores to play. But that's sort of a, an unavoidable circumstance. Well, you know, we can do that in Australia or in most. Places. Oh, you're right. You guys are. You guys have been good. We, we're 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 in, still in got a little work like, here in the in the. They got like seven people with the virus, and they all got it somewhere else. So. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm very very envious of you. Uh, so um, well, so yeah. I hope you. I uh, I'm gonna start sending you the list that I want to play, and I'll be like, okay, I'm gonna live through you. Like, yeah, let's see this. Go for it. <laughs> I um just actually set up a, a event at our local store for the end of next month. I just posted it up earlier tonight. So, well, that's awesome. So, what's the event? And maybe we can plug it. I don't know. Uh, you know, maybe there'll be some other Australian listeners who are like, hey, I gotta check that out. It's a uh, Battle of the King's Road. Battle of which the King's is a Road, okay. actual actual battle from Robert's Rebellion. <laughs> um, it's an old battle, but it's uh, just a forty point two point list at our local store. Um, yeah, we've got a, a solid community of you know a dozen players in our town. So hopefully we can uh, get everyone there and maybe a few people live you know a few hours away don't get to play much so hopefully it's worth them traveling for the the weekend to come and play and those sort of things so it should be good and we've also got a online event running at the moment too on tts that um a 30 point battle uh oh skirmish at the twins which we've almost finished i like to uh for events change them up and give people a different game mode yeah, that's always important to keep it fresh, right? I think if we're just playing 40 points and you're bringing the same list every day, you know, three, three wolves or Harmer and six Raiders, or it gets a bit boring. So changing it up points or I like the new missions, I think are really yeah. take best missions. Most of them I really like. Um, couple, one of them I'm sort of, oh, I don't know how that works. I don't know oh. if I really like that. <laughs> but most um. of them I really enjoy. <laughs> With the, uh, yeah, it's always important to keep things sort of fresh, right? And uh, we're talking to Bob from Gamers Haven, and, and they're doing some sort of thing where they give out like a kind of like achievement points or like little trophies for running like unusual things or doing unusual uh, approaches. Or it might be like, you know, running a unit with uh, a named character in every unit or, or things like that. Yep. Sort of that other things. Yeah. Just, just to make the game interesting. Yeah, just, right. You know. Because it's the Not fun. It's like a puzzle. That list. Don't look at what won the latest tournament and not right. play that list. <laughs> you know, take Brett's list. You got to just get that's why Brett's on here. He's playing all sorts of crazy stuff now, and it's going to be, you know, <laughs> be a trendsetter, right? He's like, I'm just going to run uh, four uh, Ranger tractors or something. And yeah, we've uh, been discussing that list for a little while because Brett and I are in the same team for the uh, yep free sales tabletop simulator league. And Next, you guys uh, got to you got to talk about doing something like you know uh, double stone thrower or something, and <laughs> got to make that no, the norm. Didn't go that. <laughs> um, you know, but there's a few of those units like the storm throwers and Melisandra. Why I don't think they're overbalanced like they're particularly majorly strong. I just think I just don't like the uh, I roll two dice and you just remove that many models right. or vice versa. I don't think there's any real inter interaction there. Not really as exciting. I mean, no, the models look great, but it maybe oh. isn't as, as quite as exciting as like, you know, watcher on the wall, sneaking a unit up and then like smashing somebody in the flank with a bunch of swords and being like, I just like did this cool combination that caught you off guard. Yes, that's, that's more of the fun. And I think that's the, the real strength of the game is, you know, the tactics Borg and the tactics stats and yeah. the different abilities and bringing it all together at the right time to to get over the top is good fun. 
Now, the people that you play with in your community are um, a lot of them people that have played other traditional war games, or uh, oh. do you see a lot of new people come in? Like, what's sort of the makeup? Most most of them are um, are traditional war gamers who have played other games. Mm-hmm. There's a couple who have just got into it because you know they liked Game of Thrones TV show and yeah, or the book and saw saw something they liked and decided to start playing. I think that some of the accessibility, that's always a cool thing, but it's fun to see. I feel like the community has gotten a lot broader now. We've had a lot of people coming in from other game systems and, you know, it's, I think it's definitely has arrived. Now it's just a matter of being like, all right, let's get some of the organized play going. Let's get some big conventions going again. Uh, Hopefully local store scenes are going to be able to continue to grow, you know, depending on how hard they were hit by COVID. But, you know, this is the, the rising tide is coming. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. I'm really looking. I was really looking forward to the uh, organized play app. Yeah, me too. And stuff they announced last year that you know, understand it hasn't come out. And I I feel bad for those year, guys. So. Oh. <laughs> right? Imagine if like that's your thing, and you're like, I'm going to do this thing that it's about getting people together, and they have this app that integrates it. It's going to have you know crazy features, store locators, rankings, whatever. Like, and then being like, oh yeah, no, none of that, <laughs> none of that gets to happen uh, for another no, year. Go anywhere. And it's like, what? <laughs> uh, like, well, they what probably could have released it, but no one will be able to use it. Right, exactly, right? And so, um, <laughs> you know, so we'll wait another year. It's it's okay. Like, you know, I always say, as, sort of jokingly, but, you know, Song of Ice and Fire, like, you know, I think the release schedule, there's been disruptions and things, but coming from its background, like CMON switching distributors and like kind of entering this war gaming space, um, you know, I think it's actually been, there have been hiccups for sure, but overall, like, it's getting there. And I know some places in the globe have, have been hit harder trying to get certain things. Um, but I think we're, it's always been on, like, a forward trajectory. And I think moving to those kind of bigger quarterly releases may actually help with some of that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm predicting we're going to see a little bit more smoother transitions into distribution in the future. Oh, ab- but, absolutely. I think it's, um, you know... The development and and just their accessibility to the community too as a company is really important. Yes, um, you know they sponsored our event at CanCon in Canberra, sent us over a whole lot of stock, which was really good. Just about everyone walked away with at least a unit box. That's awesome. Uh, you know, <laughs> it was you know a few starter boxes and all that sort of stuff through uh, Simon directly, and then also Ben from Blitz Mini sponsored and a local store toys toy soldier imports online store you know everyone got behind and we had a really good group there and even though we had bushfires in the country at the stage so oh my god you know, that but, was this year yeah that was this year it seems like a very long time ago <laughs> but oh. it was this year <laughs> it was only um seven months ago oh my gosh this is <laughs> was on fire. a little, little bit of like negativity come ago. in but i cannot believe that was this year and <laughs> This year officially is horrible, <laughs> but lots of good things, but oh my God, jeez. It's, um, yeah, it just seems like a long time ago, but um, it's not, it's only, you know, half a year and. Well, and then so speaking but... of the game developers being accessible here then, so we actually just had a round of updates just drop, like as we were getting on our, our call here. Um, so maybe we could cut through some of the FAQ and give some first impressions of some of the changes, or if people at home uh, aren't aware of them yet, make sure that people are aware of what the the latest updates and errata to A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game are. Yep. So let's start off with uh, looking at the general FAQ then. So what are some of the changes that we've seen come through there? Um, just some, I think they're getting some clarification about after attack and a unit is destroyed, that they're different triggers. And also surge forth, pointing out yet again that it's not part of the attack movement. It's it's a step taken after the attack. Right. It's not part of that stepping, which is interesting. And I see they've also got the target one in here. And this is a funny one. I think a lot of it came out from, uh, was it Roderick Cassell? And, uh, but really Barrist and Selmy who had that wording about targeting. And yes. it's, you know, so what they're re- ruling here is that uh, what, what affects target? Well, any ability or effect that specifically has a player selecting a unit from among multiple options or choosing when to trigger the effect, that is targeting. So an example of that would be most tactics cards because they require a unit to trigger them. And then most orders because uh, they require a unit 
even if they're part of a unit, to be able to trigger them. So things like vicious, sundering, those don't get affected. Abilities are unaffected. You know, anything that's passively active, that's unaffected as well. I had that come up in a game recently with uh, Courtney Penrose, NCU commander. It was a funny confusion, but anyway, does it target from the tactics board? So while, then... inf uh, while influencing an enemy combat unit, each time that unit is targeted by a tactic zone, one of your combat yes. units is in long range, may restore D3 wounds. To heal. So they used Craster, I believe, in a free mm -hmm. folk army and said, oh, well, I didn't target them with the tactics board. I used his ability. And it didn't say the word target, but, but you oh, picked them. that's a target. Yeah, you, you know? picked it. So this is, this is so funny because, right, you targeted them. Yeah. And so what they're saying here is that when you choose to, when you choose a unit, you're targeting them. That's right. But this is one of those ones where like someone would start talking online and I'd be listening to their conversation. They'd be like, no, 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 you targeted it. And then like five back and forth later, I'd be like, wait, what? Like. I somehow yeah. I'd be confused. Like, what is targeting? Like, what is? I don't even know. And it's like you just get bogged down in these conversations. A lot of games have um, some games have a particular target is a particular thing, different to right. choosing and and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, and that's yeah, I think that's where good that you know, they that people's up. backgrounds in other games starts to come in, where they're like, well, in this game, it means this, and it's like, okay, yeah, but you know, those rules don't carry over to this game necessarily. And then also yeah. had, if I charge and end up on top of stakes, <laughs> do I suffer <laughs> D3 plus wounds twice, right? So <laughs> as in when you move into it and then you have to resolve your combat attack, does that count as two separate yeah. actions essentially? And it's no, it's just, it's just no. one. Because that would be, if, if you've been playing it that way, where every time you charge someone and you're on stakes, you're taking like, 2d3 plus two wounds that, that that's oh. pretty brutal <laughs> oh. the giant kills itself <laughs> yeah right after that oh my gosh um and you then the, uh, uh, the senior builder a very good unit what attachment what oh that? god that would be insane for that what is it one point yeah that would one be point throw down the stakes everywhere for <laughs> stakes that's already going to be ridiculous i'm i'm uh it's fun being, I, I mostly play free folk. It's fun being free folk too, because you can sometimes be like, oh, that thing's so scary, but I know I'm going to have like, you know, way, way more units. So it's not a big deal. Like if yeah, I have, I can, you know, I can take, I could take yeah. four wounds and only pay to cost me a point. Right. If I got like, you know, my King's guard and like, you know, four combat unit army or something, then it's like, well, <laughs> now you're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, also, they said, if I, if, uh, if I charge and contact the enemy, but my alignment puts me over terrain with the rough or hindering keywords. How does that interact? They're saying like, once you are successful with a charge, it can't be later turned into a failed charge. The keywords only affect the unit if they crossed it during their charge move, not during the alignment. Yes. So I felt like that was, I, I don't know. I feel like that was clarified once I before, but. Yeah, I thought that was pretty clear. Um, the next one I'm glad they've cleared up about if multiple enemies are perfectly aligned to each other and on a successful charge, resulting in corner-to-corner -corner contact for the attacker and these elements, what happens? That they specified the other unit moves one inch away. I like how they add per the engaging multiple enemies rules on page 16. Yeah. I feel like they should do that in some of these other ones. Said. Like, yeah, because even the one above, I feel like that's in the rules. Um, yeah, but a lot of people are going, oh, but, you right. know, all this sort of stuff, so. And then uh, for the game modes, just one update for game modes. In Fire and Blood, do I gain plus one additional victory point if my marked unit destroys an enemy that would typically not grant victory points? Yes. The victory point is being gained from the marked unit, not the enemy. Yes. So I, I think that, that makes sense there as well. Killing, killing most poor bears. Yep. Uh, <laughs> They've already got some annoying human in their mind controlling them. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> taking it out on them. <laughs> and then in the Free Folk, they had uh, the update to Harma Vanguard Commander. And this is like one of those Coens that's been around. Like, what is this, the sound of one hand clapping? It's like a riddle that's been asked <laughs> for, for a while. How does the Vanguard Commander ability on Harma, the Commander version, how does that actually interact with Fainting Maneuver? the tactics card um so they this is like a it's a, this response guy gave him in two parts there's like an a1 and an a2 they have to like itemize it so there are two common questions in regard to this interaction the first is can i play fainting maneuver and then return that same card with vanguard commander 
The answer is yes, because both effects would have to be declared at the same time as they same as they share the same trigger. But once a tactics card is played, it is placed in the discard pile, meaning it would be a valid target for Vanguard Commander when the effects resolves, which is phenomenal. Like this is great <laughs> for for your armor yes. players. Um, you keep you keep fainting maneuver in your hand at all times. Yes, just like just keep it there. Put it on the side. It's got its own little space you hold. And then I'm answer that. <laughs> and then answer to the second common question is: Can I trigger Vanguard Commander, return fainting maneuver, and then immediately play it? <laughs> the answer is no. And I'll add this in here because that would be insane. <laughs> but <laughs> as once Vanguard Commander is being resolved. The window to trigger fainting maneuver would have passed. But why would it be in your discard pile? You've just kept it in your hand anyway, unless it's you just, discarded it, or, it's, you, or you were forced to discard it somehow. I mean, I guess the strategy would be as soon as you get it, discard it. I don't know. Yeah, because yeah, then when you resolve that, you just get it right then. I don't know. There's some weird, but that's another one just, too. You where could it, discard it at the end of your turn, knowing that when you need it, you could just bring it back. I guess. Yeah, that's one of those ones where it's like but, people started reading into. I know it's like rules as written versus rules as intended, but where someone's like lawyering it so much that you're like, wait a second, that would be crazy. And then uh, going down one more time, she gets another shout out. Fainting Maneuver, yeah. Harma Vanguard Commander. If my, target has the, if my target has effects that trigger from being charged from the front, such as set for charge, do they trigger? So the card says essentially that when you charge, you get to reposition, you get to put in the flank. And so no, the unit is being treated as being charged oh. in the flank for all gameplay purposes. These are um, I mean, clarifications, but that's very powerful. That's that's that very good very for strong. Harma. So yes. take that, you Lannister Halberdiers. I know you're waiting for your time to shine. <laughs> Harma, Harma Not don't today. care. Not today. Not today. Yeah. <laughs> what do we say to the Lannister spear, uh, Halberdiers? Not today. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so then jumping into Baratheon, I'll do the general one here. Does loyalty interact with neutrals in any way? Nope. Oh, yes. The Rose Knights, just specifying the deadly boom only does one wound each time you restore. So even if you restore, you know, the tactics board three wounds, you Thank only do one wound to the other unit, not three. Thank God, you monsters out there uh, that were trying to do that. That's. <laughs> I had someone talk online that their friend played, um, used Tycho. Oh my god! And took a unit and did eight wounds because he took Tycho, used his ability to put five on, and then took the heal and did another eight, and pretty much he had a almost a full unit. And the other guy was almost dead, and it turned into the other way before he even rolled any dice. That's yeah, that's crazy. So okay, good. That's, that's clarifying wrong. that whoever's out there. <laughs> hopefully, you can find to play some. That. God, you're a naughty boy. Uh, the roller faithful. If I have multiple faith tokens, can I trigger the when this unit is destroyed effect of Heart of Fire multiple times? So here's the issue. So technically, yes, but triggering the effect multiple times will still only allow a single other roller unit in long range to attack as effects of the same name do not stack. The multiple instances of Heart of Fire from the same unit don't stack with itself. So that's one of those ones where maybe people could sense. read into it and be like, oh yeah, technically, but it's sort of a, a closed loop. They could they could have just said no. Right, and it would be the same thing. <laughs> no, because you can only do it once. You can trigger the ball, but at only one person can take advantage of it. And then can I potentially trigger both Heart of Fire effects from the same attack? No, the second Heart of Fire is triggered when the unit is destroyed. The first can only be triggered after an attack has been successfully completed or has been fully completed. If the unit's been destroyed, it has not survived to reach this step, meaning it's no longer on the battlefield to trigger the effect. So that one's close as well. Uh, Elena Tyrell, we sort of see uh, kind of a common basic question about how do influences and cancellation effects kind of interact. Elena causes an NCU that has influenced the unit to lose all abilities. What happens? So she blanks an NCU that's already influenced the unit. The NCU loses all abilities, but that'll have no effect on the unit that it is influencing. So it's important to note, however, that the unit is still being influenced by the NCU. Also remember that regardless of any other effects, influences are always removed at the end of the round. So if the influence is out there and you blank an NCU, the influence stays out there. It's already in play. Yes, but it has zero effect. But I suppose there's ways you could uh, cancel 
Alana's influence and get your benefit back from your influence. Right, exactly. So you get this weird kind of counterplay situation. Yeah. <laughs> Next one's Melisandra. How does Melisandra interact with Varys or similar effects that trigger on NCU activating? Sadly, for anyone who doesn't play with Melisandra, both effects trigger at the same time, meaning simultaneous action. The active player goes first, so Varys can do nothing to stop her ability. Yeah, he's not so good at dealing with those warlocks and, and power users like that. <laughs> well, you know, I guess it's just something in the game that there's no way to deal with it. Yep. There's the, no chance to The Lord of Light works in mysterious the Lord ways. Lord of Light. That's right. All right, the Brianna Blue stuff here is is a great clarification but i feel like what it's really doing is just giving baratheon players like evil ideas yeah. like every baratheon player is going to read this and be like oh yeah so Don't brienne the blue free. do you like to run brienne the blue yeah yep i mean who um, doesn't like a free attachment oh free attachment but you gotta have renly in there so you gotta have renly commander in one of these uh Thing, so yeah, it's not too a, much of a stretch though he's not so bad there's the downside to it it's not much of a downside oh <laughs> <laughs> poor randy but how, do, how does the uh well this is the correct to entertain with counter charge so renly has a tactics card where when a attachment is destroyed another attachment can charge or attack um so they're saying that you can use both a counter charge you is can, when, when uh, after a friendly combat unit is attacked. Attacked, yes. But then Renly's card is... Oh, oh, yes, you're right. You can charge in or make an attack. Right. So, and then the other one, which is probably the more fallen one, is uh, Brienne the blue and counter charge. Oh, because Brienne gets to attack for free whenever you... Um, yeah. Renly's attack, so you could use the counter charge to charge in and then use her ability to do the second attack gotta declare them both at the same time pretty scary um, though you can set up some crazy combos there why wouldn't you why wouldn't you oh my you? gosh so and, she's... and here's the funny thing based on that you do last stand oh. Renly's unit gets to attack and Brienne's unit gets to attack twice yeah <laughs> and then you can do your surge fourth that's brutal god that that is uh Yes, very, very full on. Not many things are going to survive a couple attacks from a strong unit. Um, the Red Priestess. Yeah, that's just kind of a clarification. What dice are being referenced by reroll all dice? They say yes. all dice from the it's morale a test. test. Where you can go, I'll just roll the one I didn't want to get. Yeah, you for the rest of the game, again. I roll all these. Yeah. <laughs> and then, well, that uh, gets to our next lot of stuff is... Uh, Oh, Loved right, by the exactly. Small folk and Eddie's brother Shadow. How long do these effect last? Until the end of the turn. That's my favorite, it's not, though. That's it's not for the next 12 months in every game you play. <laughs> you know, a little bit of clarification on those. Yeah. But <laughs> I think we can be safe to say if it doesn't say when it ends, it ends at the end of the current turn. Right. I just imagine there's like conversations at the table with people. So, like, when exactly does this end? Like, oh, it's. It's still going. It's like the next next game. It'll be it'll That's be going right. still. So I'm playing a list of tournament. I've got Love by the Small Folk <laughs> and in his brother Shadow already triggered on this unit. So and I, that was from the previous game. So you know we're going to the finals here. That's I'm ready right. to go. Yeah. <laughs> Tar Targaryens get their first FAQ here, and uh, if the ability for Unsullied, if an ability or effect removes Unyielding, and this unit gains Condition Tokens, what happens to those tokens? Once unyielding returns, things. This is actually a really core idea to the game, guys. Once a condition token is on something, it stays on there, right? If it says it's it prevents unyielding prevents things from gaining tokens. Once the token's on there, it has already been gained. That effect doesn't interact with it at all. So it can still be expended. So there's a lot of strategy in like nullifying this unit's abilities to get tokens onto it. Yes. And that really hurts when they get vulnerable tokens. Yeah. And panic tokens on your unsullied. <laughs> Or weakened is even worse. Weakened? Well, they still hit on a 2+. plus. <laughs> oh, I know. But, you know, when you charge in and you got those re-rolls and you re-roll everything other than your sixes so you get more precision hits. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's true. You said that with a little bit of glee. That's, uh, <laughs> that's all those precision hits. Um, Unsullied's a, a very strong unit, but they, they are. Uh, die, die very easily if they get in the wrong position. Hi, Pri, the Warlock of Karth. 
When do you add the plus one to his roll? Before or after I see the result? After you see the result? It's you may do it. So why would you pick it before when you want to roll those ones? And right. Get rid of that tactics hand for my minus the player. And then Barristan sell me, that kind of goes back to that idea of targeting exactly what abilities and effects can Barristan prevent. Uh, any ability or effect that is specific, any ability or effect that specifically has a player selecting a unit from among multiple options. So this goes back to that targeting thing we talked about earlier. It's the same interaction. Next, it's uh, Bell is the strong. During the attack, does Dogged prevent one wound from failed defensive saves as well as the panic? From failing the panic test, no, it's all one attack. It's, he only gets to stop one wound in total. That could be a pretty good tip. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that would be a his veteran strong. pit fighter ability is that idea of like retaining those battle scars. And so if Belwaz has somehow moved to another unit, does he keep those tokens? Yes. So like those tokens go on the card with him and they follow his card around. Yeah. But in Clash of Kings, which is like the exception always, right? <laughs> with Clash of Kings, if he gets redeployed in Clash of Kings, no. The unit is redeployed exactly as when they were originally fielded. So you can't bring him back in with all those tokens. The next one's a very good one, is the uh, Unsullied Officer. Oh my god. Do I god. need to have a unit left to activate in order to trigger Relentless? No. Relentless is not reliant on having an unactivated unit. The next one is even bigger. Follow-up. How does this interact with previously past my turn due to no longer having units left? Even if a player has passed their turn, they still have a turn, meaning at the start of any turn, effects such as Relentless can be triggered. Yes, this means a player can pass multiple turns before the end of the round. Trigger Relentless. I had played it not that way before, which may be just me misreading it. So you can just sit there and wait till they've done everything else and go, oh, so you're finished? Well, now I'm going to use the Unsullied Officer and do my attack. That's so good. That makes Unsullied Officers definitely worth three points. That's phenomenal. <laughs> my gosh. Okay, wow. So Even moving put... your dogs around at the back doesn't help you. Yeah, that's good. That, that's going to really shift things up a bit. That really is a big step up for the uh, Targaryens. And then martial superiority from Jor Mormont, Westerosi Tactician. What abilities are lost exactly? Any that directly reference the attack or are marked with the melee or the range symbol icons. So this doesn't override the general rules in regards to loss of abilities. Uh, example, these types of abilities that only remove abilities printed on the attachment unit. Abilities and effects granted, uh, abilities and effects gained from external sources cannot be prevented unless directly specified. So really, yeah. anything that directly references the effect. Yes. Uh, let's cut to... Which, Go ahead. Most people. Oh, I've got the neutrals open right here. There's just, just one thing there. Can multiple instances of cut them down affect the same unit? Few people have been playing this if you've got multiple units. Yeah, there's a little bit of free folk no, play you could do that way too. A unit that's being affected by an ability effect isn't, or it isn't, a cut them down affects the enemy unit. Multiple instances will have no effect. So you can't have two lots of cut them down on the one unit and they suffer four extra wounds. Yeah, that, this, this seems like, I, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you know it, it, and while it was fun the other way to try and argue that but that's a bit much Stark Bowman exactly what does ignores intervening units and terrain include well Bowman ignore any keywords associated with terrain cover block line of sight and may trace line of sight through any unit friendly or enemy so it mm. really in all instances then right ignores those you units can, you can have a unit and a palisade in front, and they still see you and shoot. Yep. Um, they clarify uh, martial superiority, the same thing as Jora. Yep. Superior positioning. Yep. What happens if a target moves out of range or into position, making it so they cannot be successfully charged? Rub section of the card triggers before the enemy moves, after pivoting, but before rolling charge distance. In this case, the enemy will roll and move as normal, though most likely will fail. Contact the unit, resulting in a failed charge. This would also come into effect with um, build a crossbows right. and things like that that get to react before you 
charge in, can move out of range, and yep, failed that panic test. That that always uh that always feels bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jumping over to Night's yeah. Watch. Speaking of builder stone throwers, how much oh, of a unit's yes. tray has to be within long range to make it so it cannot be targeted? So a unit is within a given range if any part of its tray is inside the listed range. So you don't have to be wholly within, just within, no, just, just a little bit within. Make sure you pivot that little bit to make sure. And this one, I feel like I knew, but I, I just like always forget when it comes down to it. People are always asking me, and I'm like, I can't quite remember uh, Ranger yeah. Hunters. When I disengage from an enemy, what comes first, their pivot or my quick fire ability? The enemy pivot is, is resolved before any other effects that would trigger as a result of the disengagement. I feel like we always come to that conclusion. I just always have to like, we have to like think about it and talk about it. So you disengage, yeah. they pivot, and then the, the rest of the effects go into, into play. Uh, and then. So the next one is about mighty en enhancement and awful Yarwick first builder. How does the card specific. Uh, Specifically, a vision of critical blow interact with builder scorpion throws throw or attack. Uh, a builder, both critical blow and scorpion bolt throw or attack modify attack dice. They do not stack and, and cannot add to each other. In that case, the only can choose whether they would like two rolls from the six or three. It is strongly advised that successful deals of three hit is your final replacement to choose. <laughs> um, I might as well start if you're still down. Yeah, let's do it. it. Mine's Sandor, Sandor Clegane, the Hound. Again, can cut them down. Stack? No, it cannot. And that's all that appears to be there. Okay. So there's a lot. That's yeah. a lot to go through. But it makes mostly it's it's pretty sensical, right? That's all. There's nothing really outrageous there or unusual. I think the Harma one is a helpful clarification. Most of the other ones were, you know, pretty run of the mill. The the un, the, the Targaryen one. That's crazy. That is a very big change. That changes a lot. Um, I'm interested to go back and sort of test some of those things out then with the Unsullied Officer now. If any an Unsullied Officer could join a dragon. Well, you know, we'll have to see. When we find out how many points they cost or what that looks like, what, I'm sure there will What do you think, be... based on Drogon's card, do you think his points will be? Oh, God. I don't know. I'm thinking eight. Yeah. So my, yeah, maybe like, I don't know. Cause the thing is like, I, I feel like I would say eight or nine um, and maybe nine people are like, well, that's way too high. But because there's so many cool cards in the Targaryen tactics deck that are make it so they're super maneuverable. Like I, I know it's not hard to kill a dragon, uh, you know, nah. not, not incredibly hard. Like my Raiders, <laughs> they're going to have a hard time, but, but uh, it, they're so maneuverable with like swift retreat and all these cards. So like a really skillful player can get a lot out of them. So it's like maybe uh, that could be nine. Unstoppable, ad unstoppable advance. Yeah, but I played it with um in a proxy game just to yeah. test it out. We did it at eight points. Um, playing three folk actually, and he charged Harmer into the unsullied, and they were just sort of to the side. And then I've played unstoppable advance, and then devastating impact, and gone halfway across the table. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Charged into Harmer, killed her. And he was hoping, because, <clears throat> you know, he's three folk, he's got more activations, obviously, right. than a Targaryen. And then you got, like, I'd an overrun in there dragon, somewhere. And he can, he can get his, uh, get his giant to charge my dragon. <laughs> but I obviously managed to kill Harmer with a, you know, four plus D3 or three plus right. D3 hit, so then a panic test on top of a corpse pile, because I'm playing Feast for Crow, and then surge forth out of sight of the giant. So he's giant oh like, oh, God. what do I do now? Oh, my God. Yeah, and, you know, I, I could see it maybe at eight points. I don't know. I feel like it's around nine, but um, then list building gets kind of weird, right? Like, if you're, you know, if you're going to, I don't know. I'm hoping there'll be a way to run, like, three dragons. Um, I'm, like, I'm hoping they're, like, eight, seven, six, and each one gets a bit Oh, like that it. would make sense, actually. Broken's obviously going to be the strongest. Right. So you can probably always take six points because, you know, it's pretty easy. It's a cheap activa you know, cheap activation for Targaryens. <laughs> I mean, the Targaryen <laughs> armies are going to look so cool, though, right? Oh, yes. Being like, I, you know, like uh, you got your Unsullied, you got your horse riders, you got your Thraki, you've got your dragons, like just you got lions, lions like the Harakara. Like, how, how do they 
cool stuff. Like that's the free folks stick. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> but man, but, you know, woolly woolly mammoths throwing spears with their tusks. I mean, hey, yeah. <laughs> And that's what I mean. Like, I think the game's going to be doing really well because in, in game space, uh, if I had to be critical of a Song of Ice and Fire of the Miniatures game, I think in the time that I played, my only real criticism is, uh, criticism has been that the 2D terrain is makes it so when you're in a, a convention hall or you're playing games and people are walking by the tables, um, sometimes other game systems that are very thematic will have scenery that also will catch people walking by and they'll be like, oh man, like... Is that a down like ATSD or Star Destroyer? Like what's being played over here? Where the terrain yeah. in this game is is sometimes um, you know, harder to draw people in. Uh, and so they the visual appeal from a right. Distance. But when we start getting dragons and all these other things on the table, like I think that sort of makes up for some of that. And it, it pulls people to be like, wow, you're moving around these, you know, cool trays of beautifully painted miniatures or or not, but just cool miniatures. And you've got dragons too. I think that will catch a few more eyeballs. And elephants, we find. And elephants. elephants. Oh, trust me. I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it down the downloaded the mammoths because I feel like uh, I could talk too much about that. <laughs> People get <laughs> start messaging me like, "Man, really more free folk mammoth stuff." Like, or maybe oh, I just do my points. own my own episode. I'll just talk about. They got they got to be two points each because free folk need some more activations and some cheap use. <laughs> Can you imagine, or like, what if they're not even, well, he did say, Fabio said they, things could go wrong, basically, he said. He made some pun about like, you know, uh, they, things can go south, and we know the free folk like don't like going south. Uh, <laughs> so like, maybe there'll be a downside to them, and so maybe they will be cheaper, like. I think they will, but they will be, uh, you know. Not two points, that maybe, would be. <laughs> maybe, maybe if they, uh you know, get some injuries or fail a panic, they run around and dump a few raiders on their way around. I wonder. Oh, yeah. Or, like, you have to, like, keep things within a certain distance to herd them or something. I don't know. Yeah. It would be cool either way. I'm I'm just so excited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the models look amazing, like all those models they've released. So Absolutely. Should be very, very good few months coming up, rest of the year. And so uh, Northern Front Gaming, you guys are coming out with your battle reports, which are always amazing and are, are great to watch. So if you haven't checked out Northern Front uh, Gaming on YouTube, uh, be sure to. And, uh, yeah. and then you've got some upcoming, some upcoming tournaments. Yeah, we've got a local tournament here, and I always do something on Tabletop Stimulator. And I'm also doing up some um, power rankings for the three sales Super League team event and what faction are you planning oh, what faction are you running in that i'm actually free folk there we go <laughs> i've been converted i um someone offered a free folk army pretty cheaply locally and i jumped on it and a couple of starters and followers of bone and I'm like oh this is awesome i'm ready to go cave dwellers and i've uh Put it on the table and, and just really enjoying instead of being low activations in Night's Watch or Baratheon on high activations. And it's a, a different way to play, making me see how those high activation armies play a bit differently and making me a better player, I feel. So I've got the Free Folk. Brett's got the uh, Night's Watch in our team. The Northern Realms um, are, are well uh, represented. Yeah. So. Very well, good. We're working together. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I look forward to more of your content and best of luck in your, your tournaments. And uh, I can't wait for all these new shiny things to come out for uh, A Song of Ice and Fire. Absolutely. Well, I think we've all, all got that same itching to see something available and more models on the table. Yes. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, so many cool updates. So make sure you check through the rule books if, uh, if you haven't looked at the FAQ updates. And in the meantime, I hope you get your miniatures on the table.